because I, I've only started working in the uh, foundations of quantum mechanics fairly recently, like a couple of years ago. And I just feel like people are talking past each other all the time. And it starts with the problem that no two people agree on what they mean by an interpretation of quantum mechanics to begin with. <laughs> What's up, everybody? From Nautilus, I'm Brian Gallagher, and you're watching Behind the Scenes. Today, I'm speaking with Sabina Hassenfelder. Sabina is a theoretical physicist at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies, where she works on the foundations of physics. She's the creator of the popular YouTube channel Science Without the Gobbledygook, and her writing has been featured in places like New Scientist, Scientific American, The New York Times, and others. She's also the author of Lost in Math, and most recently, Existential Physics, a scientist's guide to life's biggest questions. Her recent story in Nautilus was titled, The Trouble with the Big Bang, quote unquote. A rash of recent articles illustrates a longstanding confusion over the famous term. Sabina, thanks for joining us. Good to talk to you. To start off, would you mind summarizing your background intellectually and as a science communicator for our viewers? Yeah, sure. So uh, my background is physics. I've broadly worked on the foundations of physics. So that includes everything from quantum gravity, phenomenology of particle physics beyond the standard model. I've done a little bit of cosmology. Currently, I'm doing astrophysics, uh, dark matter, and also the foundations of quantum mechanics. I'm also interested in the philosophy of physics um, or science more broadly, and I do a lot of science communication. I've been doing this for 15 years, somewhat more maybe. Uh, so I'm uh, not just trying to understand how things work, but also getting it across to people who don't, you know, who, who don't have the math to follow the literature. Right on. And your recent effort in Nautilus was exactly about that science communication and a problem that's found more in popular science than in the way scientists or physicists specifically talk and that you distinguish between three different ways people tend to understand the Big Bang. Would you break that down for us, a, a summary of the piece for our viewers who may have not read it yet? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there are actually three different ways that people, like if we're talking about the non-expert broad public, understand the word Big Bang. It's rather the problem is caused by the opposite. It's that they have a very specific idea of what the Big Bang is. It's the beginning of the universe. Um, that's what it, what it used to mean. Uh, but what's happened in the past 10 years or something, uh, maybe it's got something to do with the TV series, is that uh, the word Big Bang has also been used to refer to the expansion of the universe more generally. So not just the, the beginning, but much earlier phases, or in some instances to a particular model for the expansion of the universe, which uh, in the literature is called Lambda CDM or sometimes the concordance model. So as you correctly say, uh, it's not uh, a confusion that we have in uh, the scientific literature, but it's something that seems to have happened in science communication and the popular science media. And with, with, with some of the recent headlines from the James Webb telescope, uh, it, it became really obvious what's going on. So what was the issue exactly with the images coming out of the James Webb and the controversy about whether those images brought some evidence against the Big Bang or however um, it's supposed to be understood? Yeah, so there's no issue with the images. And also, uh, I mean, we have to distinguish between the images and the data that is being collected by the James Webb telescope that uh, physicists actually use for their analyses. I mean, the images are great and, and everything, you know, I enjoy them as much as everybody else. Uh, but for scientists, it's really the data that's that's more important uh, than the pretty images. And so uh, the way that it looks is that some of the data from coming out of the James Webb telescope, uh, especially that for uh, galaxies way, way back in time, 
um, doesn't seem to fit all that well with uh, the concordance model, which is the currently accepted model for the expansion of the universe. So that's the one with uh, dark energy and dark matter uh, that probably everyone has heard of at some point. Um, loosely speaking, the reason is that um, in this model, there's a very specific picture for how galaxies form. Um, it's a hi hierarchical buildup. So they start small and then they grow to larger ones by mergers. And um, people have put forward some rough timelines for how this uh, growth of galaxies is supposed to work in Lambda CDM. And basically, they're, they're growing slowly. Um, and According to this prediction, there shouldn't be really large galaxies at early times, at the times that the James Webb Telescope can look back to. However, uh, the images seem to show uh, very large galaxies. And I say seem to show because this data is very, very young and people are still trying to learn how to properly analyze it and the error bars are huge. Uh, so this is very much um, scientific discovery in progress. Uh, so no, no definite conclusions. Um, but this is the way that it looks like at the moment. And several people have written preprints about it, you find them uh, on the archive. Now, um, this is a problem, if it holds up, it's a problem for Lambda CDM, it's not a problem for the expansion of the universe. Um, so the, the competing hypothesis for um, the expansion of the universe is a particular modification of uh, gravity. Um, actually, I should not say a particular one, but because there are, there are various different models, uh, but they all have in common that the universe expands. Like this is literally something that no one, almost no one <laughs> questions. The, the evidence is just so overwhelming. Um, but if you have confused um, a particular model for the expansion of the universe uh, with the Big Bang, um, then now it, it may sound like the new data from the James Webb Telescope sheds doubt on the origin of the universe, uh, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever, because those galaxies, I mean, when I say in the early universe, uh, we're, we're still talking about something, something like uh, several hundred, hundred million years after the Big Bang. So, I mean, it's, it's a great instrument and all, but it's not telling us anything about the beginning of the universe. Got it. And one of the points you address in your piece, and also you expand a lot more on in your book as existential physics is how the universe began. And in your piece, you, you say that, I believe you suspect that we will never be able to get the data that will be able to distinguish different theories for how the universe began, because it's just, it's too far back in time. And there doesn't seem to be any way we could get the data that would, be necessary to figure it out. Um, could you elaborate on that point and what you say in your book about that? Yes, of course. So first of all, it's um, certainly correct at the moment. Uh, we can't tell apart different stories for how the universe began. So the Big Bang is really just the simplest thing that we can do with uh, our current theories. We just extrapolate it back in time. And what's, what's happening is that the energy density becomes higher and higher if you go back in time until it's infinitely large. Uh, and this is what we call the Big Bang. And this is where um, the equations stop working and most physicists, me included, believe that this just means that Einstein's theory eventually breaks down and has to be replaced by something else. Um, we, we don't have the theory that it should be replaced with. Um, so I would say for what the science is concerned, um, the answer to how did the universe begin is we don't know. But what you can do is you can just replace the equations with some other equations. So when you go back in time, you let the equations be very similar to Einstein's equations until you're safely out of the range that we can experimentally test it. And then you attach 
whatever, something else. And there are lots of ways to do this. And this is why we have so many theories for the beginning of the universe. Maybe it wasn't a big bang. Maybe it was a bounce after previous contraction of the universe. Those bounces can actually repeat. Then you get a cyclic universe. Or um, some people have the idea that it was a collision of higher dimensional membranes, or it was a gas of strings, or it was something entirely non-geometric. So it could just have been a network that had no particular geometry to begin with. With. geometry was also only generated later. So, so there, there are lots of ideas for the beginning of the universe. And um, the issue is that with current data, we, we can't tell them apart. So all, all of these ideas um, do lead to some predictions. And physicists always stress this, you know, my, my great idea for the beginning of the universe makes this and that prediction. Uh, but um, you, you can always amend the theory so that, that they fit to whatever the observations are going to say once you have them. Um, so I, I don't think it's a particularly conclusive statement. Um, yeah, it's, 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 so that's the situation. And now you can say, of course, um, well, we, we can still build better instruments. Um, you know, we can build bigger telescopes. Um, those only help us so far because um, there are um, so, so light can only travel freely after the uh, CMB was uh, formed and we have already seen the CMB. If you want to look uh, back in time to even earlier than the CMB, you have to do something else. Um, you could, for example, try to collect neutrinos because the neutrinos decouple from the rest of the matter earlier in uh, the universe. So uh, they stream freely for a longer time. Um, the problem with neutrinos is that they're incredibly hard to detect. So you, you would have to wait, uh, I don't know, a um, hundred thousand years or something to uh, get the equivalent of the cosmic microwave background in neutrinos. But then you would be able to look back in time further. Um, or you could try to um, measure the imprint of gravitational wave uh, on the cosmic microwave background because the gravitational waves um, can tell you something about what's happening even earlier. Um, so this is also something you can look for in principle, uh, but we, we can't do it right now, but maybe one day we'll be able to do it. Uh, but um, even, even in that case, it wouldn't actually tell you how the universe began. And I think that um, ultimately um, we're just going to run into a limit there and it partly comes actually from the way that our theories work, not so much from the observation. Um, and, and the reason I'm saying this is that all the theories that we currently use in the foundations of physics um, work the same way. They um, use an initial state and then they have something that's called an evolution law, which just tells you how you calculate an earlier or a later state from this initial state. So in the case of cosmology, the initial state is whatever is the earliest moment that you want to make a guess about. Um, and then you use your equation, whatever that is, to calculate what happens later. And then you compare the, uh, the prediction with the observation. So, um, you know, if it doesn't fit with the observation, you can forget about it. Um, so let's just assume uh, it fits. Um, well, then you still have to guess the initial state. <laughs> Uh, and where did this come from? Well, in our theories, the best thing we can say is, well, it came from an uh, even earlier initial state. But now the thing is uh, that if we want to improve our theories, uh, we have to make them simpler. It's just scientifically uh, not permissible, I, I would say, but uh, to use a milder expression, it doesn't make any sense to make it more complicated. Um, so. If it was the case that the universe actually did have an earlier phase, which was more complicated than this period around the Big Bang, for example, because there was there was an earlier phase of the universe uh, where also, I don't know, you, there were some intelligent beings crawling around, populating the entire universe, uh, and then the whole thing collapsed, and then it went through this uh, big bounce, and, and now there's us. Um, we would have no scientific justification to attach this more complicated story in front of a simpler one, which was this hot plasma uh, in the beginning of the uh, early universe. So I think it's one of the ways that our theories are fundamentally limited. Um, then there is a way, a possible way out of this, which is that we might be able to come up with an entirely different type of theory, which would not be working with this initial state and the evolution law, but at least so far we don't have one. 
Gotcha. Okay. I wanted to ask you more about um, the different chapters in your book. One of the chapters is we just discussed how did the universe begin, but you also touch on um, why doesn't anyone get younger? Uh, questions about free will. Do copies of us exist? Um, I, I wonder what for you was the hardest chapter to write to to come to any firm conclusions? Did you kind of flip-flop about how you were thinking about which way your answer would go on any particular chapter? Which one gave you the most challenge to write? I think it was the last chapter, which is also why it's the last chapter. I, I, I brought it last because I didn't, I, I didn't really know what to say. It's about the question whether human behavior is predictable. And it's, it's a difficult question because, um, I mean, the obvious answer is uh, we don't know, um, but that would have been a very short chapter. <laughs> so I had to say a little bit more. Um, and uh, I was trying to figure out uh, what there is to say. Um, so I had to talk a lot about uh, computability and what it means to predict something in the first place um, about uh, quantum mechanics and uh, that in quantum mechanics, we can only make probabilistic predictions and then I had to try to weave this all together in a coherent narrative. Uh, and, and, and that just made it really hard. Uh, so I hope in the end, uh, it kind of makes sense to the reader. <laughs> so there are certain um, domains where humans become really predictable. Like I've seen papers on um, analysis of crowd behavior and the movement of crowds of humans. And if you analyze that human behavior in terms of like a fluid, then human behavior becomes really predictable. Um, so what, what kinds of behavior are you talking about that seem really hard to predict or perhaps unpredictable? Yeah, so the behavior that I had in mind when I wrote this chapter was mostly in individual behavior, like us having this conversation. So it, it, there, there'd be no computer in the world at the moment that would be able to predict how this conversation would go. But if you look at it, through the eyes of physicists, particle physicists in particular, then we're just made up of a lot of particles. And we do know the equations by which we can predict what those particles do. So if we had a large enough computer, then in principle, we could put you and me on a computer and we could try to predict how this conversation goes. And it brings up the question like, is it possible? Is it, is it feasible? What could possibly stand in the way? And so, so one big question that this brings up, uh, I mean, I guess the first thing that, that people would say is, oh, you, you, you can't uh, get consciousness out of particles and so on. But I explained earlier in this book that um, I, I don't really buy this argument. I don't see why there should be anything about consciousness that um, does not emerge from the interactions of lots of particles. So, so I don't find this argument remotely convincing. Um, but it brings up the question, like if you were to put you and me on a computer and uh, you would be running this computation, would you actually be able to do it faster than we are having this conversation? And if not, it wouldn't be much of a prediction, if you see what I mean. <laughs> you know, if, you, if your computation finishes uh, in 10 million years, then who cares uh, if it was correct or not? Right, that wouldn't be especially useful. You want a prediction in hand with a good amount of time to be able to use it, right? Um, so let me ask you, um, can you say anything about the impact your recent story in Nautilus has had? Has, um, what sort of response have you seen to your discussion about the way people um, use the term Big Bang? Oh, yeah, it has actually, it has been really, really positive in the sense that I've actually had people quote the thing back to me, <laughs> like, yeah, so, so people in, in the comments on my social media things, uh, trying to point out that there are different ways that the word Big Bang uh, has been used and, and, and using this clarification, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if they knew that <laughs> I brought it up in the first place, but it doesn't really matter. I also got an email from someone who says uh, he, he does a lot of uh, Wikipedia 
media editing and uh, he and some other people are working on cleaning up uh, the Wikipedia entry, which I, I, I sometimes do edit uh, Wikipedia entries, but uh, honestly, I don't really have the time. And this is a really long article, so so it'll probably get some. Um, it, it'll probably take some time uh, to get through. Um, but yeah, so I, I I'm super happy about it because I, I feel like it might have made um, an actual difference in the world, <laughs> and uh, I, I guess we will see in a couple of months or so how it pans out. That's wonderful. Yeah, to get someone. Uh working on Wikipedia to actually update the piece based on what you said. That's fantastic. Um, can I ask you what you're working on right now? Uh, any papers or any other articles or perhaps uh, your next YouTube video? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on a rather ambitious paper about the foundations of quantum mechanics in which I'm trying to propose a classification scheme for how to tell apart um an interpretation from a modification from a reformulation um that i hope will be useful for people who work in the foundations to you know figure out what exactly it is that they're working on because i i've only started working in the uh, foundations of quantum mechanics fairly recently like a couple of years ago and I just feel like people are talking past each other all the time. And it starts with the problem that no two people agree on what they mean by an interpretation of quantum mechanics to begin with. So these are things like whether the wave function collapses or not, um, <coughs> things of that <coughs> nature, or whether whenever someone makes a measurement or an observation, they split into another person in a different parallel universe. I think that's the Hugh Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. Is that the sort of thing you're working on? Yeah, and that's kind of where the problem starts, right? I mean, as you say, it's called an interpretation, but what do we actually mean by an interpretation? Does it mean that it's equivalent to the Copenhagen interpretation? And if it is, then why bother? Or if the people who work on it claim that it's actually simpler than the Copenhagen interpretation, then how can it possibly be if they're both equivalent? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and to make matters more complicated, there are actually uh, quite a few different uh, formulations of, of this interpretation alone. And it's it's also the case for Bohmian mechanics. You, you think that there'd be Bohmian mechanics, the way that Bohm wrote it down, but this is only one of uh, many different ways to formulate it. And some of them are interpretations and others are not, at least in my terminology, <laughs> okay, which, which, which I've now uh, used. So I would say, um, you know, if, if you have a formulation of quantum mechanics that um, actually leads to different predictions, uh, then what's normally called the Copenhagen interpretation, then that's not an interpretation, it's a modification. And I, in, in, in my paper, I'm also trying to clean up some issues about what exactly do we mean by retrocausality about, uh, I have a video coming up about retrocausality, by the way, in a couple of weeks, which uh, I, I think will be very interesting. Uh, and super determinism. And so there, there's a lot of confusion in how people have been using those words. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that my paper is going to make it somewhat easier for people to have a conversation and not talk, talk past each other all the time. For our listeners, could you define retro causality? Okay, well, the issue with retro causality um, is that people use the word very, very loosely. And I think what people have in mind, what it means is that you 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 can send signals back in time. It's kind of like, like time travel, uh, basically. Uh, but if you look at some retrocausal models that people have actually used in the literature, um, there's no way to actually send a signal back in time, which is sometimes called is called non-signaling retrocausality. But then you have to ask, well, what then do we actually mean by cause? If there's nothing causing anything, um, so to to my eyes, at least, a lot of what goes under the name retrocausality is just a weird way of rewriting quantum mechanics. So now I've basically given away the conclusion of the video that's yet to come. <laughs> that's okay. It'll be worth watching for sure. Um, to close out, do you want to tell our viewers where they can find you online, whether you have a, a Twitter 
And I mentioned that you have a YouTube channel. Do you want to tell them what that's all about? Yeah, that's right. So the easiest way to do it is just to Google my name and, and it'll tell you everything you want to know about me more than you ever wanted to know. So my name is not very common, so it works just fine. But if you really want to know, you find me on Twitter under the handle SKDH. Those are my initials. Uh, and uh, I'm also on Facebook. I, I actually do have two accounts, one under my name and one under the channel name. And the name of the YouTube channel is uh, Science Without the Goddard Gook. That's great. Thank you so much, Sabina. And um, I look forward to more of your writing and your upcoming videos. Lovely to talk to you. Mm -hmm.